good morning, brothers and sisters, once again. We continue to pray for many in our midst. Um, we have a number who are not well, and we need to be in prayer for them. Continue to be in prayer for our sister, uh, Colleen Minton, as she remains in the hospital. We continue to pray for her as she as God leads her through COVID, there have been some positive movements uh, with her, and we're thankful for that. Continue to pray for um, Eric and Cheryl Elmer. Again, positive things that have taken place, but also just some continued needs as he continues to recoup from his open heart surgery. Very thankful for them and, and want for his full healing as well. <clears throat> there are a number of others that we could talk about. Uh, but a lot of needs physically, whether it be from COVID or that nasty flu thing or the upper respiratory thing. There's a lot of things that have taken a lot of people out right now. Um, and a reminder, if I may, uh, <laughs> if the worship services are going to be canceled, we will put notice out on Wood TV 8 uh, WCSG will try to send an email out to the church family as well in a timely manner to let you know. Uh, you need not call me because you may assume that we're having it unless you hear something from one of those uh, things. Fair? All right. Very good. Very good. We were able to experience the glory of Christmas together. I'm thankful, Pastor Paul, for your ministry and, and teaching us and leading us. And this glory of Christmas, I, I'm amazed every year. It is, it is uh, my favorite time of year. I think it's my favorite time of year because of the absolute delight that my beautiful wife has with Christmas time. And so I enjoy it. And, <clears throat> but I think sometimes I, I hope that we as a church family, that we have experienced it as a wondrous, glorious time to reflect on the incarnation and the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because if we don't do that, then Christmas becomes, well, it becomes a temporary distraction. It's a feel-good time in the midst of blah. It's a time where we finally get to say, ah, I like this music. It makes me happy. We get to give gifts to other people. That makes us feel good. Perhaps you, perhaps you receive a gift. That makes you feel good. And Christmas becomes a nice distraction. Where the rest of the time, I'm filled with deeper questions. Christmas has only served as a distraction from the deeper, those deeper questions that I have. Christmas becomes a distraction from the things that, that we know deep down truly matter. It becomes a distraction from the anxiety, the loneliness. Becomes a distraction from more questions. Who am I? Who am I? What is my identity? I spend a lot of time with people as a pastor, friend, family man. spend a lot of time with students. And I found something increasingly troubling over the past few years. And especially in 2020 and 2021. And it's this. People are being pushed at every side, including you and me. We're being pushed at every side. To give answer to this question, 
what do you identify as? What do you identify as? You look at September 21 journal of the LGBTQIA journal, and you'd be asking yourself, which of the 64 genders do you identify as? Or which of the 78 gender identifiers do you identify as? And I see a generation of people who are being pushed so hard to determine what they identify as that they don't even know their own true identity. At the very fundamental level, brothers and sisters, God cares less about what you identify as. He is far more concerned that you know your true identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you cannot answer the questions of what you identify as until you know who you truly are. We have a whole bunch of people who will tell me I identify as. And it's not just gender. It's not just sexual orientation. It can be conservative or liberal. It could be left-wing nut job or right-wing nut job. Amen? What do you identify as? I need to know what you identify as so that I can know if I let you into my tribe or not. Because if you don't identify as in the way that I identify as, then I have nothing to do with you and we can't even really talk with each other. Why is that? Because whatever it is that we've chosen to identify as has removed us from our true, real identity. Who we've been made to be. And it grieves me. Because I see a number of people, I see a number of people in churches who are drawn away by false identities. I've chosen to identify as. Well, Pastor Halstead, I'm asked this question at philosophy conferences and gatherings. Don't you identify as Christian? No. Aren't you a pastor? Yes. Of a Christian church? Yes. And you don't identify as Christian? No. I really don't have that kind of power. God, in Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, has seen fit to make me fit to be his child. He has made me a follower of Jesus. See, I don't have a whole lot of strength and power in my own will and decision-making to say, I identify as Christian. Without the saving work of Jesus Christ, I'd be as lost as anyone else. I'm trying to figure out my identity. Strange thing about identity, though. You can never truly know who you are apart from God. You can never truly know who you are apart from God. God grants identity, personhood, image.
We've seen the same kinds of wrestlings with people who are experiencing loss. The last two years, people who are living in the midst of COVID. What do you identify as? You a vaxxer or anti-vaxxer? You a masker or anti-masker? I generally know because I have your emails. Which is it? I want to know... I want to know what your identity is. You identify as Republican or Democrat? Have you been bought and paid for by the shed blood of Jesus Christ? And are you this very moment embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord? Because if that's true, then all things have been made new. And you and I, we have been granted new identity in Jesus Christ. Happy New Year. Again, I didn't ask what you identify as. I want to know your true identity. For all of our concern, for what we identify as in our contemporary culture, very few people who know who they truly are. And yet one more first Sunday of January gathering of the saints at Calvary Baptist Church. One more time thinking about tables of worship. One more time being brought back to and reclaiming the center. One more time re-recognizing. One more time re-remembering. One more time reclaiming our identity, our new identity, our new identity in Jesus Christ. Turn with me once again to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And actually, you'd do well to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 as we start there. Because as we look today at 1 Corinthians 10, verses 14 through 22, the context again of chapter 10, verses 14 through 22, with this paragraph, Paul is bringing to a conclusion the long argument that he began in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, which concerned the people of the church of Corinth going to temple feasts. Once again, while the argument has some caveats, it remains a consistent argument from chapter 8, and I'll read verses 4 through 6. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods, many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. There is one Lord, Jesus the Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Are you satisfied with the self-revealed identity of Jesus Christ? And are you satisfied with your identity in Jesus Christ. As we come to the one table together, those of us who are embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord by His grace and for His glory, we remember again in chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, we remember to affirm that there is only one 
God. We read it. An idol has no real existence. There's no God but one. Well, there are people who say different things. But for us, there's one God, the Father. This is the one true, living, triune, creator, redeemer God whose story the Bible tells. There is only one. It would be silly to bow the knee to someone or something that is no God at all. Agreed? Knowing and affirming that there is only one God, it would be strange for us to gather together and even engage in conversation about worshiping some false God. If we truly affirm together in our new shared identity in Jesus Christ, if we affirm there is one God, we submit to that reality. Boy, that takes care of a lot of our decisions for 2022 already, doesn't it? It sets the direction for so many things. One God, and we will worship Him and Him alone. He will not share His glory with another, for there is no other. We affirm there is only one God. But not only that, in those same verses, we affirm, secondly, that our existence is from the Father and through Christ. That's significant. Right there is identity. Why can't a person know their true identity apart from God? Because apart from God, you have no identity. Because apart from God, you have no life. God is the creator and sustainer of life. You want to know what life is intended to be and who you've been made to be? Then you need to know the one true creator, redeemer, God. you must. You cannot know yourself fully apart from knowing God and yourself in relation with God. We affirm that our existence is from the Father. We affirm that our existence is through Jesus Christ. And we give Him praise. But with that identity, with that identity comes purpose. And the third affirmation we make in these verses is that our existence is for the glory of God. Get this straight, brothers and sisters, along with me so that our, our heads are, square, are screwed on straight for 2022 and our heart orientation is correctly directed. There is only one God. And we have our existence and our identity because of and as a result of His grace. And we are not living as fully human if we are not living for the glory of God. It is to that end, for that purpose, that He has created us, that we would glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. Not just out there somewhere, but this day, today. Regardless of circumstances, may he be glorified and may I delight in him this day. Do you identify as? No, my identity is. My identity is. I've got to get that squared away so that I can make right, wise, moral choices about these other questions that people are asking me about what I identify as. What you identify as, that's not your identity. It's what you've chosen to identify as. What your identity, who you truly are, is only found in relation to God. We affirm 
by testimony of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. There is only one true, living, triune, creator, redeemer, God, whose story the Bible tells. We affirm that our existence and therefore our identity is from the Father through Jesus Christ. And we affirm that our existence and our identity is to be for the glory of the good name of God. Is every redeemed person in the house with me so far? See, brothers and sisters, once again, this is what's at the heart of idolatry. And that's what we're talking about in 1 Corinthians 8, 9, 10. Idolatry. Idolatry is when we affirm something else as being true than those three affirmations just made. Idolatry is when we affirm something more to our liking or something more to our enjoyment or something that we more fits with who we want to be. Listen carefully to that language because it's challenging all of my brothers and sisters, including me today, with this. I want to challenge us deeply, and then I'm hoping that we are inspired greatly. But the challenge deeply is this. When we affirm something more to our liking or more to our enjoyment, that language sounds an awful lot like, I identify as. Regardless of what God says my identity is, I am choosing to identify as whatever I want to be, whatever suits my inclinations, whatever suits my desires, whatever suits my goals and purposes, whatever sets, whatever serves what I want for me. The heart of idolatry is affirming something other than there is only one God, our existence is from the Father and the Son, and our existence is for the sole purpose of the glory of the good name of God. We reject the identity that we've been given and choose to worship at other tables of idolatry and say, I identify as something else. I will affirm reason, I will affirm some cheap substitute to be more real or more true instead of God and his identifying markers for me. And we can have a propensity to be neither satisfied with our identity in Christ nor the revealed identity of Christ himself. A large survey was taken of middle school and high school evangelical church attending regularly regular attenders middle school and high school evangelical church attending girls of the thousands interviewed of the thousands surveyed 90%, 90, 90% said that a person could not be satisfied with Christ. And that seems about right. Don't, don't get me wrong, Jesus is important, right? Jesus is important, but he's an important part of my life. And that comes from us many times sharing the gospel that way. Invite Jesus into your life so that he becomes an important part of your life. 
Jesus never wanted to become an important part of your life. Jesus wanted to kill us in order to make us new so that we would be fit to participate in his life. That's a totally different orientation. That's a new identity. That's freedom from the bondage of sin. That's freedom to live the way God wants us to live and love. Are you satisfied with the self-revealed identity of Christ himself? And are you satisfied with God revealing your identity in relationship to himself as an image bearer? And now through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ as a redeemed son, or a redeemed daughter. If we were to skip forward now to the context just before, I won't read it, you can at another time, but 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. Paul shows by way of example that Israel's idolatry, if you just skim through there, Israel's idolatry had caused their overflow or their overthrow in the desert. And then he moves on to show that fleeing idolatry by not participating at the worship of other tables makes sense based upon our own experience of the Lord's table. But with the example of Israel and moving now into our example of celebrating the ordinance of the Lord's table together, the Holy Spirit, superintending the writing of Paul, has told us that the participation in these things is because of a shared identity with God a shared identity in God, in Christ. And for us, new identity in Christ, which becomes explicit here. And all of that leads up to verse 14, which is the central point of the whole deal. What does verse 14 say? 1 Corinthians 10, 14. What does it say? For God's glory, for the sake of and the sanctity of your true identity, flee from idolatry. We're only two days into 2022. Look around with your brothers and sisters in Christ and covenant with one another. I will, we will flee from idolatry of all forms. I will flee from idolatry. We will flee from idolatry. We will affirm that there is only one God. We will affirm that our existence is from the Father and through Christ. We will affirm that our existence is for the glory of God alone. And we will make our decisions and live according to that reality. For God has said it is so. So flee from all idolatry, all cheap substitutes, all of I identify as, and rather to surrender to the reality that God has made me to be. God has made me to be human, an image bearer that reveals his character throughout the earth. God has made me to be a new creation for those of us who are embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord. 
forgiven, redeemed, loved. I have repented from sin and idolatry to worship the one true living God. The basis of Paul's teaching to not participate in the fellowship or communion of other tables, to, worship, to not worship other gods at other tables or feasts, is at least twofold. First, there is an understanding of the sacred meal as fellowship, communion, that is signified by a sharing of believers in the worship of God in our new relationship vertically. Because of the shed blood that was spilled for us, because of the body which was given for us, the body upon which our sin and our sins were placed upon, Jesus says, I take all of your identity in Adam. That's the beauty of the incarnation. That God was pleased to take on the fullness of humanity in solidarity with humanity because you cannot redeem what you do not assume. You will not redeem what you do not yourself own. So Christ takes on the fullness of humanity to redeem the wholeness of humans. So that we would be his children. So there's a sharing of believers in a new identity. The old is gone, the new has come. This vertical relationship is new because of my sin and my sins and my sinfulness. I had broken my relationship with God. So had every one of you. We were not okay with God. We had no hope. We've heard it all before. Yeah, but this first Sunday of January is a good time to re-remember and re-recognize. And reclaim. Jesus came and took on the fullness of humanity so that broken relationship could be restored. Our sins needed to be forgiven, and there's nothing that we could do to cause that to happen. But Jesus paid it all. Amen? Jesus paid it all. He took on his body the fullness of our sins and became a curse for us. He took on our old identity and our old identities. He took on our I identify as is. And hanging there in the gallows, Jesus Christ crying out in agony. Find your new identity in my redemptive work. That this shared identity is not only vertically, it's also horizontal. I get to share this identity with other sons and daughters of God. I get to share this identity with brothers and sisters. I get to share this identity with people who have been bought with the same blood, who affirm the same one true living God, who affirm the reality that our collective existence, just as much as our individual existence, is for the glory of God and the protection and promotion of His good name, that our existence as sons and daughters of God is from the Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit. A group of redeemed people who gather to worship the Lord, thanking Him as we participate at one table 
because of our new shared identity in relationship vertically with God where he has done all that is necessary for us to enjoy redemptive fellowship with him both this day and forever. And for us to enjoy redeemed fellowship with one another as the sons and daughters of God. Not according to what we identify as. According to our true identity, because of who God the Father has made us to be through the person and work of the Son, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and all of that wondrous work of salvation having been applied by the Holy Spirit. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Holy Spirit. The wondrous three in one. So the heart of the matter. 1 Corinthians 10, 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? What's the answer, brothers and sisters? Absolutely. When we drink of the cup, we are, we are restating and renewing covenant We are making proclamation of the Lord's death until he comes. We are not making proclamation that Jesus died. I mean, in one sense we are. But it's so much further than that. We are making proclamation of the reason and efficacy of why Christ died. Look around you. We are his answer. That should delight you and me. Isn't it a participation in the blood of Christ? Of course it is. It is a collective participation of a collective new identity that we've been made new people. Redeemed people. Sons and daughters of God. The only true God. The one who gave himself for us. Well, the bread that we break, is it not participation in the body of Christ? Yes. The reality is our sinfulness, our old identity. They were placed upon the body of Christ so that everything that we would identify as, everything that we would selfishly and pridefully have for ourselves or do for ourselves or claim for ourselves that was contrary to God's revealed will, contrary to God's revealed character, could be placed upon the body of our Lord and forgiven through His shed blood. I need to participate in that reality. as does everyone. Because there is one bread, we who are many just one church. We're one people. Surrendering and worshiping at one table. Because there's only one God. And we have a shared identity. 
and we share in one purpose and one mission. Aren't those who eat sacrifices and participate at the worship of other tables, aren't they just that? Aren't they participating in false realities? Well, yes, that would be just as true as we are participating in the cup and the bread, in the body and blood the identifying markers of who we've been made to be in Jesus Christ. Verse 17, it speaks loudly of the solidarity of the redeemed community, the shared identity as one body in Christ, which does allow, it does not allow any other unions of this kind. Who we are, we are together. And what we do, we do together. We share reality. We cannot escape it. We surrender and we participate in this reality that God has made known. I don't want you to be participants with demons. Verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and at the same time participate at tables that speak things resoundingly contrary to God's revealed will and character. We cannot live with those divided loyalties. We must not live with those divided allegiances. That is not who we have been made to be. We have been freed from those other faulty allegiances. Amen? We have been freed from the bondage of those other cheap substitutes that had attained our loyalties for so long. We come together, we gather together at this one table. Remembering who God is, what He has done, and renewing covenant with him as we remember who we are, whose we are. Can I encourage you, brothers and sisters? New creations in Jesus Christ, amen or no? New creations in Jesus Christ. There's something about Christmas time going into New Year that we like the new. We like thinking about the possibility. For those who are embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord, this is no mere possibility. It is reality. We have been made new. In regeneration, we have been given new life in Jesus Christ. In conversion, faith and repentance. We have been given a new direction in our life. In justification, we have been a new status in Jesus Christ, we are guilt-free because Jesus has paid it all. We are forgiven because Jesus has paid it all. In sanctification, we experience persistent newness or progressive newness. In perseverance, we, we enjoy and delight in the reality of persistent newness. And in glorification, when Jesus Christ returns and makes all things new, in glorification, we get to experience eternal newness. Hallelujah or no? <laughs> We've been given a new name, participants of a new kingdom. We have a new king, a new household, a new father, a new future, 
a new hope, a new love. The old has passed away and all has become new. I am a child of God. I am a redeemed joint heir in Jesus. I am a saint. I am a new creation in Christ. He sought you. He bought you. He claimed you. He named you with a name for all eternity as his son or his daughter. All things have been made new. And with the fullness of that newness and renewing covenant with God and one another, we come to this table as new people. Before we do, brothers and sisters, I invite you to pray. As we do what 1 Corinthians 11 tells us to do. Let every man, woman, who would eat of the bread and drink of the cup, let them examine themselves. Let them pray. Let them think deeply. Ask the Holy Spirit to shine His brilliant holy light in the darkest crevices of our human hearts and minds and reveal if there is anything that is hindering our relationship with God. Anything that needs to be restored in our relationship with brothers and sisters in our church family. Prayers of confession, of repentance, turning to prayers of thanksgiving and joy because the one true living God well he's made us new and he has been pleased to deliver us from enemy to child and invited us to dine at his table when we are discerning that way of the body of the Lord, then we're ready to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Let's give ourselves to prayer.